Hello everyone and welcome to this Global Fleet Champions webinar on developments in video technology and the impact on safety, kindly sponsored by Mixed Telematics. If you're new to our webinars, Global Fleet Champions is a partnership campaign administered by Brake, the road safety charity, to prevent deaths, injuries and pollution caused by vehicles driven for work. To learn more about the work that we do and to access fleet safety resources and more events, please visit globalfleetchampions.org. And our webinar today looks at developments in video technology and we've got three fantastic speakers who will be discussing topics such as developments in that technology to date uh, and how they've impacted fleet and road safety, the future of video technology and what to consider when implementing it. A huge thank you to the sponsor of today's webinar, Mixed Telematics, for their support, both of this webinar and of our work more widely. We really couldn't run our, our series of webinars throughout the year without the support of our sponsors like Mix. So on to our first speaker today. I'm delighted to introduce John Wall, who's the Programme Manager for Future Vehicles, Environment and Sustainability at Austroads. Uh, so I'm just going to and bring John back online. Great, we can see you now, John, and if you want to unmute yourself as well, that's great. Great, thanks, Carolyn, and thank you for the opportunity um, to uh, talk to you today about vision-based systems and road safety. I'm going to take you through a bit of a history lesson in terms of uh, how cameras have been used in road safety and what we're looking at today in a whole range of areas, both inside the vehicle and outside the vehicle. Uh, to start with though, I'd like to acknowledge our Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first inhabitants of the nation and the traditional custodians of the lands where we live, learn and work. We pay our respect to our elders, present and emerging, for they hold the memories, traditions, cultures and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of Australia. I'd also like to acknowledge and respect the Treaty of Waitangi and the Maori as the original people of New Zealand. A little bit about the program that I run uh, in Austroads. The Future Vehicles and Technology Program was established in 2019. Um, our vision is that all employees of uh, members, the 11 owners of Austroads, which are the government road uh, and transport agencies across Australia and New Zealand, have an understanding of how future vehicles and technology can be used to improve the capacity of their organisation to deliver services that improve the lives of the communities that they serve. We work across five theme areas around connected and automated mobility, low and zero emission vehicles, physical and digital infrastructure support for those future vehicles and member capability, which is all about how will transport agencies support uh, what sort of skill sets and, and uh, services do we need to provide to support these future vehicles that will improve road safety and improve environmental and sustainability outcomes for our agencies as well. Well, the history of uh, vision-based safety systems actually goes back a, a long way. Um, this is the 1956 Buick uh, Centurion, and the Buick Centurion uh, debuted, debuted at the 1956 uh, motor show. Um, it was the earliest car to actually use uh, vision-based systems, and you'll notice that uh, this vehicle doesn't have any rear vision or side mirrors. Uh, they, that duty was actually performed by uh, the system uh, that was in the vehicle. So uh, two cameras um, that were, were added to the vehicle to give the driver a view of what was behind, as well as what was in front of the vehicle. So really ahead of its time. Uh, we can uh, go back to um, the, the next major system. And I'm sorry, I'm just having problems with my slides. I'm hoping that's going to work, great. Uh, in 2006, uh, Toyota introduced the first driver monitoring, uh, which was called driver attention monitoring that used cameras uh, in its Lexus model, the GS450H. The system's function cooperated with the pre-collision system in the vehicle and used infrared sensors to actually monitor what was going in, on inside the vehicle uh, in terms of driver attentiveness, um, the system included a 
camera placed on the steering column which tracked the face and used infrared uh, LED detectors. So if the driver was not paying attention to the road and a dangerous situation was detected by the vehicle, the system would warn the driver by flashing lights, warning sounds, and if the driver took no action at all, the vehicle would automatically apply the brakes, uh, followed by a warning sound um, to uh, hopefully bring the driver's attention back to what was going on ahead. In 2008, the Toyota Crown system actually went a little bit further and it started to detect whether the driver was becoming sleepy by actually monitoring the driver's eyelids, so whether the, the eyelids were closed or open. The idea of speed cameras, so infrastructure using vision-based systems, can actually be traced right back to the 19th century. In 1894, in a science fiction novel, novel, A Journey to Other Worlds, set in the year 2000, it included a description of instantaneous Kodaks that were used, as in Kodaks, the film company, was used by police to enforce speed limits. In uh, 1905, Popular Mechanics reported on a patent for a time recording camera for trapping motorists enabled the operator to take time stamped images of a vehicle moving across the start and end points of a measured section of road. The time stamps enabled the driver to be, uh, the speed to be calculated and the photo enabled a identification of the driver. In 1958, uh, Maurice Gaston uh, produced the gastometer. Um, he was a Dutchman. Uh, the gas, Gaston's wish to better monitor his average speed on a racetrack and he invented this device to improve his lap times. The company later started supplying these devices to police as enforcement tools and the first one was introduced in the late 1960s. It used film cameras and in 1965 uh, the Gastometer was the first a camera to be installed at a red light or at a traffic, set of traffic signals. Um, to detect motorists actually going through the red light. The company in 1971 uh, was the first company in the world to couple uh, the camera with a radar system, um, uh, which was manually operated by a police officer. And then the first mobile speed traffic camera was actually introduced by this camera, uh, by this company in 1982. This is a, uh, a picture of the first, one of the first speed cameras actually installed in the state of New South Wales, where I'm from, back in 1999. And I was actually involved with the installation of that camera. And I still remember today being absolutely berated by the regional manager of our northern region of the state for installing one of these cameras in his region. Uh, he did have a V8 at the time, so I think there might have been a slight conflict of interest in there in terms of uh, whether he thought automatic enforcement should be introduced in an area to which he travelled on a regular basis. Uh, Vision-based systems now are quite commonplace, and here is a list of all the sorts of technologies that we are starting to see in many of our vehicles, and perhaps in many of the fleet vehicles that you're managing today as well. Many of those use vision sensors, some use other sensors such as radar and LiDAR as well. But if you want to have a look at more of these things, Jump on to the US website, My Car Does What, which has a great explanation of how these technologies actually work. Technologies that range from increasing the stability and control of cars to providing warnings about crash threats or automatically intervening to uh, avoid or reduce the severity of a crash. Many of you are probably aware of the, the vision-based systems that passively alert a driver of potential dangerous situations. For example, uh, lane departure warning, which uses a camera alerts a driver of an unintended or unindicated lane departure. Forward collision warning using cameras have the ability to indicate under the current dynamics relative to the vehicle ahead if a collision is imminent and whether the driver needs to brake to avoid the collision. 
So there are a range of these sorts of systems that originally started out and Subaru was certainly one of the pioneers with their eyesight system, um, as well as others like Mercedes, uh, Lexus, uh, Toyota, that we've also spoken about in BMW. So these systems originally started off as warning systems, but soon they were able to be coupled with automatic braking systems um, to uh, do low speed braking events. And I think Volvo with their city safe program back in probably the mid 2000s was one of the first more affordable systems to be released onto the markets, at least here in Australia as well. Driver monitoring uh, takes a camera from looking out onto the road network and turns it around and starts to look at what's happening inside the vehicle itself. So face and eye tracking algorithms can measure the driver's position, their eye closure, and when safety parameters are exceeded, audio alarms or powerful seat vibrations uh, can be activated by the system. Uh, sometimes these systems also include uh, footage that is kept electronically around that particular event, maybe 30 seconds or so around that event. So a fleet manager can use that system to actually validate that the warning um, was legitimate, but also use it as a bit of an education piece for the driver if, for example, they want to bring in a behavioural program as well. Um, so. I've used a number of these probably for oh, easily a decade. We've had that installed in our research vehicle um, and they are very effective in terms of the modern types of algorithms that you get now. Um, and I think uh, we'll talk more about that through the presentation. One of the other things that I was involved with was actually a new type of vision technology. And in 2018, I was asked to uh, trial the very first uh, enforcement vision-based system to detect illegal mobile phone use. Uh, this happened in New South Wales. Um, and it was a fascinating project to actually be involved in. So the, the project itself now has moved from the trial stage um, back into a full deployed system um, now within New South Wales and moving um, in many countries of the world into full programs. It works through uh, very powerful cameras that can detect um, illegal mobile phone use in vehicles. And I believe that the system we were trialling was was able to actually detect illegal mobile phone use in vehicles traveling up to 200 kilometers an hour um, through the uh, deployment site. Uh, we have both fixed and mobile coverage now. So uh, systems that are fixed to, for example, gantries over the road, but also can be deployed to trailers. What happens with this particular system is that the system captures an image and then it uses artificial intelligence to detect whether or not a person is holding onto the steering wheel and then whether or not a mobile phone is actually in use. Once it's detected and it gives um, a, a figure on the accuracy that it believes that it's detected the mobile phone, the artificial intelligence system then sends it on to a human operator who does the final review. Um, and then uh, an infringement can be issued for that. I've got a couple of example photos that you might have seen from the system in terms of this, a really interesting one with our driver with two hands on the phone, and this is a fleet vehicle, um, to uh, texting whilst the passenger is actually steering the vehicle. Uh, this one, a heavy vehicle, again, uh, traveling, I think this vehicle is traveling around 90 kilometers an hour. Um, loaded with what appears to be dirt in the background. And here's the driver texting as they're driving down the motorway at 90 kilometres an hour with both hands on the phone and just resting um, the steering wheel um, sort of on their, their arms near their elbow. Uh, and this is an interesting one. Um, what appears to be potentially drug use. Um, this did go to court. Uh, the driver was fined not for drug use, but for a whole range of offences associated with this particular photo, but also 
the registration of the vehicle itself. A, a little note of caution um, though, you've got to be really or pay a lot of close attention when you're communicating with your drivers or with others around what the technology does do and what it doesn't do. This particular article went worldwide where our minister talked about uh, us uh, providing an electric shock to truck drivers who uh, were detected by an in-vehicle camera system of uh, being fatigued or being sleepy. Now, I'm sure that a shock would have woken up the truck driver, but it also may have caused the truck driver to have a crash. And this all came about because I took the minister's uh, staff out on a trip in our research vehicle at the time, demonstrated the fatigue system, which caused the front seat, the driver's seat to vibrate quite extensively. Um, from there, it went back to the minister that, uh, look, this is a really important piece of technology. It, it vibrates and shocks the driver into staying awake. The minister misinterpreted that, thought that the seat was giving the drivers an electric shock and uh, it was gone worldwide. Uh, it was both in the US and the UK about how an Australian uh, government was going to bring in legislation um, to uh, electrocute truck drivers who were uh, drowsy or suffering from driver fatigue. Um, be really, really careful when you explain and have a good communication strategy about how you introduce new technologies because you never know where it could end up. And I think that is the end of the presentation. So uh, back to you, Carolyn. So moving on to our next speaker, um, we've got Brody Bomberg, who's from our sponsors today, Mixed Telematics. He is the managing director for Middle East and Australasia for Mixed Telematics. Thank you, Caroline. As introduced, my name is Brody Bomberg. I'm the managing director for Mixed Telematics across our Asia and Oceania regions. I'm going to delve into video telematics today as it has become a transformative technology, enabling step change in driver performance. I'll be covering three areas. Uh, what is it doing? Where is it going? And how customers are adopting the technology, including a real video from our value customer board. You'll be able to see why drivers are starting to demand these technologies to make their workplace safer. Firstly, we're at an inflection point where video technology is now commercially viable and able to elevate road safety performance for fleet operators. Video itself will not make your driver significantly safer, but implementing camera technology as part of a suite of motor vehicle safety controls offers significant improvements by increasing the robustness of your existing controls. For organisations that are conducting risk assessments for their driving activities, when you add video as a control, you can expect to mitigate the risk of motor vehicle crash and also reduce the severity of an incident, leading to better outcomes for your road safety performance. Video impacts your vehicle standards. Ability to audit against vehicle cab housekeeping and passenger load, it acts as a second set of eyes for your drivers, keeping them safe and assurance that your journeys are conducted safely and emergency response processes are better informed. So how have we evolved to using video and why? 15 to 20 years ago, we were providing real-time alerts to drivers when they were speeding, braking or accelerating harshly and reports to managers so drivers who were continually breaching the thresholds were coached and trained to improve. We were also providing second by second speed and engine information that enabled retrospective insights into an incident, leading technology for crash investigations at the time. Jump forward 10 to 15 years ago, cellular tech, uh, net networks and GPS technology became mainstream and were able to track vehicles in real time and start to visualize positional information. Further forward, five to 10 years ago, mobility started to become mainstream and we added access to the information for mobile users, providing readily accessible and rich mobile experience. Just five years ago, we led the industry launching fully integrated video, providing even richer context to what was happening in the vehicle. 
Video creates unparalleled context to what is happening in the vehicle and on the road, with the ability to automatically save, send and view video without human interference now ensures that the vital context we need, we have it when it matters most. Incident investigations are now completed in a fraction of the time. The detail is already laid bare within just minutes of an incident occurring. Now that we have rich context of what is happening in the vehicles, nicely organised and visible direct from reports, historical trips, timelines and even mobile, the next journey is artificial intelligence. We are layering our hugely successful mixed vision offering with artificial intelligence to deliver real-time detection and intervention when distraction and fatigue present, mitigating the risk of the most prominent killers on our roads. This provides a commercially viable solution for preventing drivers from falling asleep at the wheel and keeping them free from distraction while operating the vehicle. Added benefits of monitoring, following distance and lane deviations serve as greater driver aids. These images show real algorithms running over live video, determining at-risk behaviours in real time in the vehicle. This is a hugely exciting advancement as previously the presence of fatigue and distraction was only detected passively through unusual behaviours or sadly a motor vehicle crash. We have a long list of customers who have adopted our video based products over the last five years and we continue to hear great feedback on the value it is adding to their businesses. Where incidents are captured and there are learnings we often seek to use the information to show other customers so they can also benefit. Unfortunately and understandably customers are very hesitant to share video based footage for others to learn which is why I'm really pleased and excited that Borg Manufacturing are leading with the sharing their experiences and in this case footage for others to see how valuable it can be. Typically we have driver and road facing footage and audio from within the cabin and today we'll view a forward facing video demonstrating how video telematics has supported the driver of a truck to show they had no involvement in an incident the one I'm about to show. I'm losing count of how many times heavy vehicle drivers are able to refute and prove they were not at blame for a crash, providing greater support for the wider adoption of video telematics. I'll play the video now and we'll see the video is of a heavy vehicle and this is a forward facing view and the vehicle is overtaken by a four wheel drive. The driver of the heavy vehicle is maintaining good consistent speed uh, good lane uh, positioning and then we'll shortly see that the vehicle in front quickly goes out of control and has a crash leading to a rollover. In this case the driver is able to use this evidence roadside to the authorities and prove that they were not at fault and in fact reacted safely and in a timely manner to prevent further injury. I really want to thank Paul for their contribution and willingness to share their experience and we consider them as road safety leaders. So just to show it isn't just Borg who have benefited from video telematics, here is further feedback from some of our other customers. There's plenty of it and there's much more information available through our website. I'd like to thank you for your time today and I'll hand back over to Caroline now and happy to take questions later. Thank you. So on to our final speaker for today, and um, we've got Andy Price, who is the Director at Fleet Safety Management. So hello, everyone. Um, first of all, thanks very much, Break, for inviting me to come on and share my thoughts on the effective use of data. Um, very simple, a very simple agenda today. We're going to start off by looking at what an effective work related road risk management program looks like and where technology fits into that. And when I talk about technology, primarily talking about driver behavior telemetry systems uh, and camera video systems, where that fits into that process. And then we'll just go on to look at how to effectively use that technology and some of the pitfalls to avoid. So the first question is, well, where does this technology fit into an, an effective work-related road risk management program? 
Now we're going to spend quite a lot of time on this slide. Um, this is based on the uh, well-known health and safety principles of plan, do, check and act, but as this applies to work-related driving. And it's a process that you can use in all bits of your business. Um, you don't have to do exactly the same things with, with all different vehicle types, with all different drivers in all different countries, um, but it shows you a process that you can follow so you can get some consistency there. Now, before we talk about the detail, I want to talk about the two things that encircle the process. That's management and culture. When I talk about management, I'm not talking about your managers, although they, though they do have a critical part to play, and we'll talk more about that later. I'm talking about how your safety program dovetails into your operating practices and procedures, um, your so-called safety operational balance. Because if there, there was a mismatch between what's required from a safe driving perspective and what's required from an operating perspective, operations generally win out. So when I'm working with customers, quite often my prime recommendations are, well, actually, you've got to make some changes to your operating practices and procedures to create an environment in which employees can drive safely. Because without, without that, then they're still going to take risks. When I talk about culture, this is your on-road safety culture. And management have a tremendous part to play here as well, supporting your program, applying the rules consistently to all people at all levels in the business, and also they've got to be seen to be driving safely. Now, the worst thing you can have is uh, to launch your road safety program and the next day, the managing director is seen driving out of the car park deep in conversation on their phone. Looking at some of the detail now, if we start in the plan phase, well, your, your bedrock here is your policies and procedures. These, these provide a framework in which everything else sits, and they've got to be embedded in your business before you do anything else. So if you invest in some technology, so if, for example, you, you fitted um, driver behavior telemetry to your vehicles and you switch that data on today, you look at it tomorrow, uh, you're going to find lots of speeding incidents. And you will, let's be honest. And if th those sorts of questions aren't covered in your policies and procedures, well, what are we going to do about that speeding incident? If these aren't covered, then, then you're not going to be in a position to manage them. So you have to think carefully before you invest in technology, do my policies and procedures cover this? Now, we're going to talk more about manager training later, but suffice to say here is that it's a critical bit of the process and it's one that many organizations overlook. In the do phase, this is where our risk assessment comes in. Now, a typical risk assessment would look at the, the, the driver, um, including maybe their core competencies, the journeys they're making, and the vehicles they're using. Um, and that's going to tell you who is at risk and why they're at risk. And without that bit of information, you're not in a position to choose the appropriate intervention. But by necessity, a risk assessment is a snapshot in time. And you may have done a risk assessment, so they may be one, two, three years old. What the dynamic data coming from camera and driver behavior telemetry systems allows you to do is get a much more immediate view of the underlying risk situation. It won't tell you why somebody's at risk, but it will tell you something's changed and so you can investigate further. In the check phase, well, generally, the way we look at and measure our road safety performance is looking at the collisions, number of collisions, types of collisions, severity of collisions. Um, but again, that's very lagging data. Something's already happened. Whereas the more dynamic data I was talking about earlier coming from your telemetry or camera systems can actually give you a much more immediate view about how you're performing. And, 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 and again, if things are going well, that's, that's, that you, can, you can use that to, to, to promote your program. If they're not, then you can, you can use that data to refocus and understand why something's going wrong. The most important bit in the check process is the root cause analysis, and we'll come back to that later. In the ACT phase, um, this is where the program can help develop the on-road safety culture. You know, what's your communication strategy? How are you drip feeding safety information into your employees? Um, and hopefully what that will do is when, when the driver is faced with a situation on the road, safety is at the forefront of their mind. But here again, your technology can help. You know, the, the feedback that from the camera camera data, the feedback from the telemetry systems can give a, a driver uh, a, a, an immediate understanding of how they're driving. You know, some of the systems have, have um, a feedback on an app 
at the end of every journey so that you've got that immediate feedback about how that journey was and that helps to develop the, the safety culture. And you'll see this is illustrated as a, as a circular process. You know, initially you'll look at the high risk areas quite naturally, but every time you refocus, you can look at lesser and lesser risks. And that's how you achieve continuous improvement in your road safety performance. Now, by necessity of time, we don't have, to, we don't have, a, have, have enough time to go into the detail, more detail here, but hopefully that gives you a flavor of some of the key elements of an effective work-related road risk management program. So you're thinking about investing in some technology, investing in camera systems, investing in driver behavior telemetry, or maybe you already have. I guess that begs the question, well, how do I get the maximum return on my investment from a road safety perspective uh, from that uh, investment? Now, the first thing to say here is that these systems generate a lot of data. Don't get bogged down in that data. What you need to look at are exceptions and trends. Now, what the sort of exceptions and trends I would um, be interested in from a risk management perspective would be speeding. When I'm talking about speeding, I'm not talking about a threshold speed. Some of the older telemetry um, systems just reported a threshold speed. I'm much more interested in uh, speed against the posted speed limit. Uh, especially in urban areas where there's lots of vulnerable road users. So I'd be much con more concerned about speeding in an urban area than speeding on a motorway, although both are bad. Other things would be um, harsh acceleration, harsh cornering, harsh braking. But again, the messaging here has to be very clear to your drivers, because actually we don't want to discourage harsh braking, because harsh braking could be the difference between having a collision and not having a collision. And we don't want our drivers not harsh braking because they think they're going to get into trouble because of the exceptions generated from the telemetry system. So the messaging, messaging has to be clear. Safe driving from this perspective is all about uh, eliminating the need to brake harshly. We may look at fatigue indicators, like how, how long journeys are made um, without a break and when those breaks are taken, how long are those breaks? But the most important bit here, the most important bit, is we need to understand the underlying root cause why these exceptions and trends are happening. And we need to ask ourselves the important but very difficult question is of what have we done as an organization that may have contributed to these exceptions and trends? Really important question to ask, really difficult one to ask. Even if we've got camera data, you know, we may have um, be able to see the prevailing road conditions at the time of the incident. We may be able to see the driver, but we've still got to ask ourselves the question, why? Why was the driver on the phone at the event time of that incident? Were they just bored? Were they talking to a, a colleague or a family member or a friend? Or did they feel they had to be on the phone to their customer, to the office, to their manager? We need to ask the question, why? Why were they speeding? Did they not see the change in speed limit? Were, are they thrill seekers or did they feel they had to speed to meet a business objective, to get to the customer on time, to get the number of deliveries they need to in the day? Whatever it is you're doing, you need to ask that question. And that brings us nicely on to the, to the line manager, because if you don't know the underlying root cause of why the collision occurred, how can you choose the appropriate intervention? And I argue quite strongly that the best people in, in most situations, in most organizations to carry out a driver debrief, looking at exceptions and trends from telemetry data, is their line manager or supervisor. They're the controlling mind. They're effectively telling the employee how to drive, what they need to do whilst they're driving. But of course, driving is a very emotive issue. And most people aren't equipped to be able to sit down and talk about somebody's driving. So the line managers and supervisors, as I mentioned earlier, need to be given some training. They need to be trained in their roles and responsibilities in your road safety program. They need to be trained how they can influence um, how somebody drives. But most importantly, they need to be trained how to conduct these driver debriefs to get to the underlying root cause. It's a similar argument in terms of they should be the people doing the post-collision debriefs. They should be trained to do this because they're, they're best placed to know what the underlying root causes might be from a management and an operation perspective, not just assuming it was down to plain old bad driving. Just finishing off on reporting and key performance indicators, normally when we report our road safety performance, as I mentioned earlier, 
we're talking about the number and type and severity of collisions, but that's lagging data. This is already something that's gone wrong. Actually, we get much more immediate data from uh, driver, driver behavior telemetry systems, from, from driver video camera systems. So use that to, to see how your road safety program is performing currently. And don't keep that data a secret, you know, especially if you're going in a happy direction, share that with the senior management team. You know, it's, it's really important to keep momentum within your road safety program, not just sort of give, give people a, a view on how it's performing once a quarter, once every half year, once a year, something like that. And, and normally when we're talking about key performance indicators, again, we're talking about number and type and severity of collisions and, and things along those lines. But actually, um, we can use our, our exceptions and trend data. We can set targets around that. Um, so we get that much more immediate sort of uh, immediacy within our program. And those um, key performance indicators from a driver behavior perspective can, can also evolve. Um, you can set uh, lower targets for exceptions and even the thresholds of which you start to measure data. So when we're talking about speeding, for example, quite often there'll be a threshold. Maybe it'll be three kilometers per hour, five kilometers per hour above the posted speed limit. Well, as you get better at managing this, why not lower those thresholds? And ultimately, you can have a zero tolerance policy once you get good at managing this. It gives you much more uh, immediacy and helps with that continuous improvement uh, in your process. So we started off looking at uh, what an effective work-related road risk management program looks like and where technology fits in. Um, but the key success factors within any risk management program are the management, you know, that safety operational balance, creating an, env an environment in which employees can drive safely and a culture where they want to drive safely, not because they have to drive safely. We looked at the importance of the line manager, uh, looking at those exceptions and trends and getting to the underlying root cause of why the collision occurred and asking the very important but difficult question, what have we done as an organization that may have contributed to those exceptions and trends? And we finished off looking at, uh, at the importance of reporting and using this dynamic data as part of your key performance indicators. Managing work-related road safety isn't easy. If it was, we'd have done it years ago. But if you get this right, if you use a proven process, and if you use technology effectively as part of that process, then you're gonna allow yourself to have a sustainable reduction in the number of collisions and claims that you're having and continuously improve that performance over time. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna help you manage your duty of care to your employees and those they share the road with, including the, the vulnerable road users. It's gonna minimize your chance of prosecution. It's gonna enhance your corporate social responsibility. But most of all, for most organizations, this is the most important point, it's gonna reduce the direct and uninsured losses associated with each collision, which is gonna improve your, improve your profitability. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much for that presentation, uh, Andy. One of the questions um, we had around this was in relation to what you said about people sometimes missing out on the policies and procedures side of things before implementing technology. What do you find are some of the, the key things that people miss in that space or that should be included around uh, technology before it's being implemented? Well, I think at a very high level, um, it's uh, what we're talking about here is a performance management issue. So the, if, 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 um, if tel telematics or camera systems are fitted um, and, and we get data that is uh, that the trend's going down or we got, we've got uh, a lot of exceptions, the question is how we're going to manage this. Uh, so our, uh, it's a performance management issue from a, from a line manager perspective. So there needs to be a mechanism within the policies and procedures that link that back into the overall performance management system of the business. So, you know, are, 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 the, um, are the policies and procedures that we've got, are they linked into contracts of employment, things like that? Um, I guess the other detail is that uh, uh, the, the likely exceptions that come out of the, of the technology that we fitted, um, and, I, and I, I used the example of speeding earlier, you know, we, we must have that included as a, sp a specific item in our, in our policies and procedures. Otherwise, the drivers might turn around and say, well, actually, there, there's nothing in our, in the, in the policies and procedures that I've read and signed and, and said I'm going to follow, 
that says I, I must obey the speed limit. So anything that we might find from the technology, we might have to have covered. As another example, if we've got a video system um, and we say, you know, you're not allowed to do certain activities in the car, maybe we're not allowed to smoke, um, then that, if that's not in the policy and procedure and the video technology says, well, actually this driver was smoking, um, actually there's, there's, there's nothing in there to help us manage that and help us sort of ultimately performance manage that uh, that driver. That is uh, the end of our presentations and it is now time for our Q&A session. So if you have got any further questions, please do put those forward um, using the question function. I'm just going to ask Brody and John to uh, unmute themselves so we can bring them onto the call. Hi, Brody. Hi, Caroline. Hello to everyone. That's great. Thanks. And I think we've got you again as well, John. Uh, yes, I'm here. Thanks, Carol. <laughs> Great, uh, thanks very much for that. So I've had um, a couple of questions through already for both of you and uh, we've got some time for questions, which is great. So uh, first off, coming to you, Brody, uh, we had a question through regarding the MIX uh, system or, or your technology. Um, does it mon uh, monitor G-forces as well? And if so, where are the forces taken? Uh, for example, is it within the truck cab or the engine bay or somewhere else? And, and does this have much bearing on the results in terms of your technology? Sure. So I think to answer that, we, we take a lot of data points from the vehicle, um, CAN bus and sensors and so on, and we do also use an integrated accelerometer. An accelerometer um, helps us to determine um, not only the inputs but the, the actions in the vehicle. So we can combine accelerometer data, which will help us understand cornering speed and g-force, um, impacts, um, the, the road surface and, and even rollovers. Um, so yes, we, we do take g-force data or accelerometer data um, and it's it's an integrated um, device within our, our uh, onboard computers and it's fitted within the vehicle itself. Um, so we, we generally don't rely on that as a sole source of truth. Um, and we combine that with, with other data points relating to the vehicle speed, um, location, et cetera, um, to, to provide a, a quality measurement of what's happening rather than just relying on one source of truth. That's great. Thanks, Brody, um, for that one. And a, a follow up um, question for you as well, uh, Brody, on that is, is whether Mix has done any work on uh, load or trailer facing cameras um, to identify issues, particularly with the the trailing gear as well? Yeah, sure. It's a great question, uh, particularly when we start to talk about chain of responsibility and load management as a topic. Um, we have seen our uh, heavy vehicle transport, so transport and logistic operators. Um, we have some fantastic customers in Australia and abroad, and, and we've really seen a strong desire to not only look at what's happening in the cab and forward on the road, but also what's happening behind them. Um, from a load and, and the lane positioning on the road and, and interaction. And therefore, um, we, we've systematically increased our capability to take more video in. So a typical um, heavy vehicle transporter today will be in, um, interested in four points of view, forward facing in cab and then two views from the wing mirrors facing back. And then we have seen some customers um, change that to be more focused on the payload on the rear or within the, the rear container of the vehicle. So yeah, it, it is important and it's it's valuable because when you're looking at the video, you're looking at a combined view, um, all time synced of all the video together along with the telemetry data, such as GPS, accelerometers, et cetera. So the answer is yes, and um, it's very powerful when it's um, configured that way. That's great. Thanks very much, Brody. Um, question for you, John. Yeah, um, is in terms of your, obviously you've got a lot of experience in this um, space in relation to uh, video technologies. What, in your experience, has been some of the most um, successful technology in terms of reducing incidents? Thanks, Caroline, for that. Um, look, I, I think if we're looking at the whole suite of video technologies that I spoke about, I think automatic speed enforcement has got to be up there in terms of, of substantial evidence um, for the role that speed cameras can play. 
um, in reducing not only the incidence but the severity of crashes as well. Um, in terms of vehicle-based technologies, um, there's a fair bit of evidence around to suggest that things such as um, automatic uh, braking, um, automatic emergency braking, AEB, um, it does show some substantial benefits. Uh, I know that there is a really interesting study done by um, Fuji Heavy Industries, which is um, the manufacturer of Subaru, where they looked at equivalent models, models that had the eyesight system, their, their particular version, and the same model of vehicle that didn't have it. And they looked at the, the crash reductions for there, which were fairly substantial. Uh, the only issue is that that wasn't actually published or reviewed by an independent party. Um, and I think it would be good to see more research done as these technologies come onto the market by independent um, researchers that engage in, in peer review. So uh, we're starting to see that. I, I know that the state of New South Wales here in Australia has the ability to actually look at the technologies that are in the vehicle and then directly relate that to the, the injury outcomes for people um, as, um, as they link the hospital emergency department data with the data around what technology is actually in the vehicle. So I think some more research into that will be really beneficial. And I'm really keen to see what the mobile phone enforcement cameras are going to yield in terms of their road safety benefits as well. Um, that's a, a fascinating area. And these, these cameras not only have the ability to do that, but they have the ability to do speed. And my understanding is that they can also measure um, seatbelt use, although none of the jurisdictions at the moment have brought that into legislation, but it's possible that one camera could do speed, um, restraint usage and mobile phone usage all at the one enforcement site. And if that's a mobile enforcement site with the view of you know, enforcement anywhere, anytime, I think that will lead to people really thinking about the behaviours that they're engaging in that perhaps could lead to a crash um, and some really adverse outcomes. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, John. And it's great to see um, all of that technology coming through now that can do multiple um, multiple issues or tackle multiple issues sorry, at, the, at the same time as well which is great to see. So thank you for that. A follow on question on that for, for you, Brody, in terms of um, your experience, Mix's experience, which uh, sort of, of the technologies do you find from a fleet perspective um, that your that your customers and, and contacts find are the most um, beneficial? You obviously gave us the example of Borg in your presentation, um, which was great, but if any other examples you've got in terms of how companies have used uh, the tech different technologies um, and what they're finding to be particularly beneficial from it? Yes, absolutely. So certainly the, the context is the driver. So often we've had data which suggests something um, is happening in the vehicle which we don't want it to and um, videos allowing them to literally click the button and confirm. So where the suspicions of um, carrying unauthorised passengers, um, Messy cabs, which are a huge hazard um, when we get in, into an incident, uh, being able to spot audit and check those. But typically it's the it's the near misses that we see in the data points, so that hard brake, harsh brake, um, or, or light impact, and being able to go back and immediately see what occurred in the cab at that time. And we've seen things ranging from um, as poor as uh, you know, watching a, a screen, some sort of media on a screen. Um, but more commonly, we're seeing distraction, um, which has previously been very hard to, to detect. So it might be mobile phone usage, and that may be hands-free using a headset, but that cognitive distraction has led to the driver not being aware of their surroundings and, and to an incident or near miss. And uh, I believe our customers like that ability to click the button and get the context and either protect the driver or work and coach the driver using that evidence um, as a source of truth and, and preventing it from happening again. And it, it's led to driver discipline, but it's also led to supporting a lot of drivers who have been in situations where they would be deemed to be at blame 
whereas they've done exactly what they can. Um, and we've seen it not only in Australia but abroad, particularly where there's vulnerable road users that might uh, veer into the path of the vehicle um, or in a blind spot. And uh, ultimately, this, this, the outcome is a, an injury or, or a fatality. And um, the video provides rich, rich context to actually what happened. So that's what I'd say they, they um, demand most and enjoy most out of the solution. Great, thanks for that, Brody. And one final question that's come through um, for you, um, which I, I think was uh, related slightly to Andy's presentation as well, asking if there, if Mix has an app-based system that can be used in conjunction with video footage. Yeah, so um, we've seen mobility um, increase rapidly. Uh, we found in this space, um, having dedicated hardware that's uh, robust and reliable and, and fitted to the vehicle has delivered the best outcome. And, you know, tampering, for instance, is a, is a challenge when the technology is first adopted, drivers want to disable it or get around it. Um, and when it's a choice to turn it on or off, um, we generally see at first implementation, they don't want to turn it on. So we've gone for dedicated um, systems in the vehicles that are hard mounts and are providing that. However, we supplemented that with um, and our, all our next generation uh, mobile technologies enabling um, drivers and, and organisations to do more monitoring from their mobile um, as opposed to relying on, on hard mounted equipment. So we're certainly seeing that, that change and, um, and customers are, are demanding mobile based solutions. That's great. Thanks, Brody, And thanks to John as well. Uh, and to all of you who sent questions in, we appreciate your contributions in that as well. Just uh, before we finish, um, just to let you know about a few other forthcoming events and activities. Uh, our next webinar is coming up on driver mental health and wellbeing in April. The date for that's just being confirmed and will be online shortly. And also Speed, which is linked to Road Safety Week this year as well. You can find the full schedule for the year, including UK webinars, on the Global Fleet Champions website. And if you can't make a particular webinar or if it isn't running in your time zone, uh, it's still worth signing up as you will be sent the link to the recording afterwards. And this year we're also running some virtual roundtables. Um, these are in-depth discussions with around 15 participants on specific fleet uh, safety topics. We're looking for a broad range of industry representatives to participate in those. So if you're interested in being part of one, it's, it's free to participate. Um, then please get in contact with me. And also our Fleet Champions Awards will open for entry shortly. So keep an eye on the Global Fleet Champions website for more details of those as well. Road Safety Week is coming up again um, quickly. It's a, a great opportunity to raise awareness of road safety with your staff. This year, the week in New Zealand takes place the 17th to 23rd of May, and it's also a UN Global Road Safety Week, and the theme will be speed, the same as the Global Week. Uh, so you can sign up and access free activity ideas and resources by completing the form on the Road Safety Week website. And you can use these resources at any time as well, not just during Road Safety Week. A really easy way to show your support is to go yellow during the week. So wear yellow or display a yellow ribbon in support of Road Safety Week. And if you're not in NZ, uh, the Global Road Safety Week, Australia Road Safety Week will all be these uh, dates this year. So you can join in um, with that Road Safety Week as well. If you're interested in working with us more and supporting our work, there are lots of ways you can do this. Um, we have corporate partnership and sponsorship opportunities available. And there are also lots of ways to fundraise uh, to support our work, or you can make an individual donation. This year it's Break's 10th birthday, and we'll have some special activities and fundraising events throughout the year. So if you want to know more about working with us um, this year and, and how you can get involved in our 10th birthday activities too, please get in touch. And if you can help us, we really greatly appreciate your support. It helps us to particularly provide free support to families who've been bereaved in road crashes and to continue providing free road safety information and advice as well. So I hope you found today's webinar useful and interesting. Um, you will receive a, an email during the next couple of days with links to the recording and other materials from the webinar. Uh, please do fill in the feedback survey when you leave. It's really useful in helping us to plan future events. Thank you again, particularly to our sponsors, Mix Telematics, and to all of our speakers today. And finally, thank you for taking part and tuning in. We hope to see you at another webinar again soon.